Okay, right, let's have a look at section B, and that's going to be map work calculations and techniques that we're going to discuss. Once again, you're going to be provided with a map, a topographical map, and an autophoto map. And then there's going to be some questions on GIS. In this case, if you look at question 3, we've been given the map of Berulum, right? Just some basic information, general information regarding it. We can see it in KZN. So immediately we know we experience summer rainfall and dry winters. We can see the coordinates has been provided of Berulum. As you can see, it's 170 years old, consists of a population of 60,000 people, right? It's quite densely populated, right? Residential areas as well as industrial areas. This is quite interesting. Caneland, so we know immediately sugarcane. So we know that sugarcane production, farming takes place, but we do a lot of processing of the sugarcane as well, processing it into final raw sugar. Okay, as you can see, they've mentioned over here, on the outskirts, we've got the sugarcane industry, right? They're busy improving and modernizing the town, improving the infrastructure, right? They've mentioned the Hazelmere Dam, just a few kilometers north of Berlin. So as we can see, it's the main source of water for the town, and it also acts as recreational activities tourist attractions for water sports and fishing. Okay, and lastly, just an interesting fact, as we can see over there, is that the Verulam is the only town in the world where the main street, Vic Street, ends in a river. That's interesting. Anyway, let's quickly have a look at the questions that's being asked, grade 12s. Our first question referred to the topographical map and the autophoto map. The contour interval of the autophoto map is it 5 or 20 meters? Now, I'm quickly going to show you where to go and look for this answer because it will always be on top of the map. In this case, we know this is our topographical map. We know that because of our scale to 1 to 50,000, right? There we can see the coordinates, 29 degrees latitude, 31 degrees longitude. But let me just quickly show you where to go and find that answer. There you can see the contour interval for the topographical map is 20 meters. Now, if we have a look at the autophoto map, and the answer is also on the bottom of it, the contour interval is 5 meters. So our correct answer right, will be 5 meters. Okay. Now, what is contours? It's lines joining place with, with equal height. Okay. Always expressed in meters. 3.1.2. Which vertical exaggeration will give the most detailed indication of the landforms in a cross section? Okay. That is quite an easy answer. That will be D. So, exaggerate means, what does it mean? To enlarge. So obviously, the more we're going to exaggerate the image or the cross-section, enlarge it, the more detail are we going to see. So the correct answer will be D. Okay, question 3.1.3. Complete the grid reference or the coordinates or spot type 114 and block C3. Okay. Spot type 114 and block C3. Now let's quickly go and have a look at our map. So we need to provide the coordinates. 114 and C3. And it's situated right over there. So let's just quickly do the coordinates, provide the coordinates for the spot height 114. First, as you know, we start with the latitudinal position. So it's going to be 29 degrees. It's going to write it here on the map. There's 35 minutes. It's going to be 36 minutes. It's 37 minutes. There's 38 minutes. So you definitely agree with me. It's 37 minutes. 
because then between 37 and 38 we have seconds now grade 12s if I take my grit of C1 and I divide it into two remember it's seconds in between 37 and 38 do you agree with me that's going to be 30 seconds if I take my first section and divide it into two we roughly get 15 seconds my last 45 okay do you agree with me that spot height 114 is situated close to 45 seconds and as you can see we have moved down south on our map and at latitude so at south now if we quickly have a look at the longitude our longitude is represented over here it's the vertical lines and we know they always move east so our longitude our degrees is going to be 31 degrees there's two minutes there's three minutes four minutes everyone will agree with me it's between four and five minutes so the minutes will be five minutes if i take my grid c3 and divide it into two that's roughly going to be 30 seconds am i correct by saying that spot height 114 will also be at 45 seconds and in which direction are we moving we're moving east okay so that's the coordinates for question 3.1.3 let's go back to our question Okay, there you go, they got 42 seconds, I got 45, but the correct answer over there will be 29 degrees, and you got four minutes, situated over there, and 45 seconds east. Okay, let's have a look at question 3.1.4, and the question is a gradient calculation. Calculate the average gradient between F and G. Okay, first and foremost, we need to go and determine on which map is F and G. Now, they provided us with the vertical interval. So, it's subtracting the lowest from the highest gives us 39 meters. So, we need to go and calculate the horizontal equivalent. And I will show you just how to do it. But let's quickly have a look at F and G. Now, as you can see, there's F and G. There. So, they asked to go and calculate the gradient between F and G. Now they have already provided us, if we go back to that slide, with the vertical interval. 119 meters at F and 80 meters at G. So they've already given us our answer of 39 meters. So what we need to do is we need to go and go and calculate the horizontal equivalent. In order to do that, Great twelves, you need your ruler and you need to go and measure your distance between G and F. In this case, remember my map is enlarged, the correct distance between G and F is 4,5 centimeters. Now going back to our question, it's 39 meters is the height difference between the two of us we measured the distance between f and g was 4.5 centimeters now very important we know that f and g was on the topographical map now there's a formula remember gradient altitude is always expressed in meters now, what formula do we use to calculate distance in meters on a topographical map? We use 500. In this case, 4,5 times 500. Okay, and what will our answer be? 
it will be, I'm just going to write the height difference over there, 4,5 times 500, that will give us 2,250. Now, the purpose of gradient is we want to see how many meters do we have to travel to see an increase of one meter. Okay, so that means we need to get a ratio of one. Now, what's the easiest way to get a ratio of one? Let's assume you've got 10 apples, right? And we want to get a ratio of one. What do we divide the 10 with, apples with? We divide it by 10. 10 divided by 10 will give me one. Okay, in this case, because we want to express the gradient, right, for every single meter. How many meters do we have to walk? So to get a ratio of one, what do we do with 39? We divide it by 39. And what's a simple rule of math? What we do on the top, we do on the bottom. So 39 on the top as well as 39 on the bottom. 39 divided by 39 gives us 1. 2,250 divided by 39 will give me 57.69. So that means, great tiles, for every 57.69 meters we walk, the gradient increases by a meter. Okay. Now, if you look at our next question, right, determine if the gradient between F to G is steep or gentle. Now, it's definitely more gentle. Okay. I even have a look at it because if we go to H to I, let's just have a look at H to I on the topographical map. Yes, definitely more steep. Uh, uh, gentle, you can see the contour lines are very close to one another and you can see the height of the spot height is 132. Okay, there's another trick station over there that shows us 192. So this area, there's more contour lines closer to one another, you know, it's definitely steeper than at G and F. Now, if we quickly have a look at question 3.2, we're going to have a look at map book interpretation. Refer to J and block D4 on the topographic map. Okay, the question is, just let's have a look at the question. Is the settlement pattern J dispersed or nucleated? Now, what's the difference? Nucleated, when they are clustered together. Okay, dispersed are when they're very far from one another. Okay, the reason why some settlements are nucleated is because it might be a dry point settlement, it might be a wet point settlement. Okay, dispersed abundance of water, abundance of fertile land, or the topography is quite flat. That's just some characteristics of it. But let's have a look what the map shows us. The question is a J, sorry, I've lost it. We need to go and look at D4, J. D4, one, two, three, four. Okay, as you can see, the 4 j situated over there, you can see that the settlements are dispersed from one another. Pay attention, it's very close to water, as you can see. Oh, that's can't see that color, let me just use green. It's close to a water resource over there. Okay. So the correct answer over there will be dispersed. State one site factor that favoured farming in this area. There's abundance of water. It's next to the river. Furthermore, it's a flat land because it's next to the river. And obviously, there's going to be fertile soil because there's water. Then, if we look at this question, our next question, refer to residential area K and block E3 on the topographical map and the photograph of the same area below. Okay. Now, as we can see in this photograph, we can see small houses. They cluster together 
and they look like RDP housing. Okay. Let's have a look at the question. Area K is a high or low income residential area. It's a low income residential area. You just look at the stands, it's small, right? The plot sizes are small, and you can see it's RDP houses. Give evidence from the topographical map or the photograph. I'm just going to use the photograph. We can see it's an RDP housing project. And small plots and houses. Question 3.2.5. How does the spacing of the contour lines indicate that the residential area is K is built on a steep or hilly land? So we need to go back to the topographical map and go and have a look at the area K. Okay, there we can see area K. We can see the stand sizes, the plot sizes is very small, so that makes it a low income residential area. And if you pay closely attention, you can see many contour lines, and they are close to each other, so we know it's steep. Okay, and pay attention, please pay attention to the street pattern. Now, let's just quickly revise our street patterns. If you quickly look at the Virulum, the CBD. Okay, we can see we have a classic grid iron pattern. Okay, now when we look at areas that's found on steep slopes, we usually look at an irregular planned or unplanned pattern. because it's just easier to build infrastructure, road patterns, if the slope is gonna be steep. Just go back to our question. How does the spacing of the contour lines indicate that the residential area is built on a steep slope? The contour lines are close to one another. Contours are close to one another. If you look at question 3.2.6, how did the steep hilly land influence the type of street pattern? And I've just mentioned it and I've shown you on the map. It will be irregular plant. will be irregular street pattern. It might be planned or it might be unplanned. Okay, our next question, 3.2.7, refer to the Caneland 6 and block A5 on an autophoto map and state one situation factor that influence the location of an industrial area. Okay, let's just quickly go to A5 on the auto photo. Here is the cane lens. As you can see, it's an industry, right? It's probably where the processing of the sugar cane is taking place. Now, in reference to our topographical map, let's just see where it's situated. I just want to clear up over here. Now, remember, the demarcated red area is where the autophoto has been taken, so we identify this region over here. You can see these buildings, and there's a river, and there's a main road just right straight over there. So let's have a look at the question again. I refer to the Canelands, right, and block A5, and state one situation factor that influenced the location of the industrial area. It's close to roads. And there was a river. It's close to 
water and there's, industri and there's residential areas around it, so lots of labour around. Now, if you refer to the Hazelmere Dam in block A1, and they've added it in a, a large extract from a topographical map, you can see the Hazelmere Dam over there. There's a picnic site, that's for recreation. There's a dam wall. Okay, now if you just quickly have a look at the questions being asked over there, then one, two, three activity is associated with the Hazelmere Dam. Now, we looked at the case study, the introduction, it is basically to provide water for the town. And they also mentioned fishing and water sport activities. So we can say recreation. If you look at our next question, how does this tertiary activity, because it's a service, contribute to the economy of the Virulam, right? The water will promote industrial development. Water is not scarce. And we can also mention, you know, the recreational activities. Recreation activities will attract tourists. Okay. Question 3.3 .3, refer to the block below representing block D5 on a topographical map. So we're dealing with geographical information system. Now please have a look to identify all of this. Keys are being used. We can identify the river. Here's the river. It's going to use different color pens. We got a road. We have our building. As you can see, we have cultivated land situated over there and we have a woodlands north of it okay let's have a look at the questions that's being asked identify the following a human-made polygon a polygon will be the cultivated land so when we're dealing with this type of data we're de dealing with polygons we're dealing with points and we're dealing with lines. So for instance, a road will be a line, the building will be a point, and the river will also be a line. And that will be vector data. Okay, so we mentioned that, it's a cultivated land. Okay. A natural line feature, be very careful for that. They've mentioned natural, not man-made. So I've, we identified two line features. It's going to be the road and the river. So which one is going to be the natural one? That's going to be the river. Three point three point two. The features represented that we just mentioned, the polygons, the lines, and the points. I'm just going to write it there, lines, points, and polygons, just for revision purposes, is, whoops, it didn't come out right. What type of data is that? It's vector data. Now we know raster data, I'm just going to write it there, Last I'll be dealing with pixels, clarity of it. Okay. Refer to block A3 and A4 on the autophoto map. Okay. Let's just quickly go to 
A3 and A4 and an autophoto map. Okay, A3 and A4, it's this area situated over there. Okay, let's have a look at the questions that's being asked. Buffering is the de demarcation of area around a feature or location. In this case, we saw it, it was the river. What evidence indicates that the buffering is takes, taking place along the river? First of all, we can identify a row of trees. And there's vacant land between, between the river and the industries. Just want to show you again. Okay, you can see the row of trees. There's the river, there's the row of trees, and there's the vacant land situated between this sugarcane processing industry and the river. Now, the reason why we buffer, because we want to protect the area. Okay. In this case, probably for pollution and erosion. So let's have a look at the next question. Explain why it's necessary to buffer the river. Right, first and foremost, is to prevent pollution of the river. from the industries. Okay, and if we have a look at the last question, if you look at, refer to blocks B4 and B5 on the topographical map, a data layer is a layer of information based on a specific theme. Okay, identify the infrastructure data layer that creates international links for the Dubia Transport IDZ. Okay, so we need to go to B4 and B5. So we want to see which data layer, what type of data layer, create a link for the Dubia Tran Trade Port IDZ. Let's quickly go to the map, B4 and B5. Okay, as we can see, there's B4, and B5, there's the Dubai tr trade port. So immediately what we can identify over there is the King Shaka International Airport. So that's definitely going to be an advantage for international investors to travel to and from to this SDI. King Shaka Airport, International Airport. Okay, how did the topography delta layer system determine the ideal location of the Dubai Transport IDD, IDZ? And obviously, we looked at it, the contour lines are far from one another, it's a gentle gradient. If we just go back to our map and we look at the surrounding areas, you can see that the contour lines are very far from one another. So it makes it much easier to construct. That's it guys, that's section B of paper two. Thank you for watching and good luck with the rest of the exams and your preparation.